Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Jeremiah Lorig, and I'm the Deputy Director of HSLDA's Generation Joshua. And I'm really excited to talk with you all today and our guest, Cliff Cramp. He's an illustrator, a, profess a professor, and a homeschool dad. So we're going to get to know Crip, uh, Cliff more and uh, we're going to talk about the creative process uh, with him, hopefully to inspire your students if they're interested in art. Uh, but uh, before we do that, I would like to quickly invite anyone who's joining in to let us know how long you've been homeschooling and if you're familiar with any of the illustrations that Cliff has done. And we'll give you a hint in a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> anyway, uh, feel free to put any questions you have for Cliff or I in the comments, and we'll save time at the end to go over those. Cliff, thanks for joining us today. Uh, we'll share a little bit of, uh, will you share a little bit about yourself and introduce kind of what you've been doing uh, to our, our audience today? Um, well, I'm an illustrator. Um, I work in the entertainment industry. I've worked in a lot of um, areas within illustration. Um, and, uh, I did, uh, teach at a university for 25 years. So, um, uh, I have, uh, since left the university and I'm just freelancing and my wife and I homeschooled our kids, um, starting at, um, grade three for my youngest, he had a tracking problem, um, which kind of put him a little bit behind in school and we couldn't figure out, we were sending them to a private school, um, and we just didn't really, you know, we we found it and then we decided uh, because both of them have ADHD that we decided we were um, going to move to the homeschool route. Um, my oldest started homeschooling in sixth grade um, and then uh, we finished homeschooling two years ago. So we oh, are wow. now f uh, done parents of homeschoolers and my wife deserves the vast majority of the credit. Um, I would help out here and there. It was great to, uh, we were eclectic homeschoolers, so we loved to, uh, and I was a big participant in the choosing of the curriculum uh, and that, but my wife is the one who did uh, most of the teaching. Uh, but one of the things that was beneficial uh, in our homeschooling experience was, um, though I had two full-time jobs for almost 20 some years, I only have one now. Um, the, uh, you know, one of them allowed me to stay home, uh, and, uh, work from home, which, uh, I do now. So this is one of my studios that I'm in, uh, and I get to work on a lot of fun stuff. So I get to be a big kid. Um, That's great. So, yeah. Hey, homeschooling, home working, it, it yep. goes together pretty well for you. Yep. Yeah, yeah. That's great. That's great. Yeah. I, I, I love your story. I, I was uh, reminded of a little bit of my story. I, I was a dyslexic student diagnosed with extreme dyslexia and uh, never diagnosed with ADD or ADHD, but I'm pretty, pretty confident in uh, my self-diagnosis there. And one of the things that my parents were able to do is give me a flourishing environment where I could could really engage uh, the world around me it where I would have really struggled in a formal school setting. Yeah, and, and we did a lot of interest-driven um, learning. So whatever the kids were kind of interested in, that's where we moved our literature and, and, and things like that. And I'm mildly dyslexic and, and my youngest is mildly dyslexic. Um, so the homeschooling route, we just figured even though um, the folks wanted to help, um, you know, we just felt that the homeschooling route was the best way to go for us. Great. Well, I, I'm, I'm glad it, it's working well for you as it does for so many, so many of our, our uh, viewers as well. So uh, you, you got started in this, this world of illustration, uh, but could, could you kind of give us a, a little bit of that story? I, I believe that stories kind of really help us understand the wisdom that, got, uh, that, the, that we can find in this world. So uh, what's a little bit of the start of your, your saga? Well, it, the, the interesting thing is you, you mentioned story, and that's exactly what I'm about. And in our university, in our program, we were able to develop um, a nationally ranked program because we focused on story. 
And story is really important because story really communicates to individuals. You can teach, um, you can inspire through story. My personal story is I come from a lower middle class family. My dad is Cherokee Indian. Um, my mom is German. My dad joined the army to travel because he was they were poor. Um, he got stationed in Germany, met my mom, um, married her and brought her home and and had a family. So coming from kind of that old school blue collar um, feel, the arts were not something that you would um, consider as a career. Uh, and so it wasn't encouraged in my home. Um, it wasn't discouraged, but it wasn't encouraged because it, it was this, this, well, you, you know, the starving artist kind mm -hmm. of, uh, um, you know, label was kind of adopted by, well, you can't make a living doing that. And so kind of my story was, is I drew a lot. I got in trouble in school a lot because I drew on everything. It's the way I think. I sit in meetings and lectures and at church and those kinds of things. And I'm, I doodle and I tell stories, um, but I'm listening and, and it's the way I kind of communicate. Um, and, you know, I dropped out of college because my dad got sick and he had just started doing well and he opened a business. So I dropped out of college to um, run our um, family business. Uh, my dad never really got well. Um, and after, you know, I was only gonna drop out for a year and then that became two years, that became four years, um, it became five years and I had gotten married um, and my wife deserves, you know, a ton of credit um, for, um, you know, the, the personal success I have is really also a team success with my wife because she knew I wasn't happy in the family business. And she said, you know, you should go back to school. And um, and I was like, well, that's kind of all of my friends had graduated college. They'd gone and they'd started working or they had gone from high school to um to trade and things like that. And they were all working here. I'm married, running a family business, not really, in, you know, I was good at it, but I didn't, you know, so I can't see myself doing this. And my yeah, wife so you felt like a little bit like your ship had sailed already. Yes. Oh yeah. And, and that is now a completely different perspective that I am a firm believer in mentorship to kind of shatter those ideas that ships have sailed. Um, so around 24, I'd been married for two years. My wife said, uh, you know, you love to draw. And I was doing little art jobs here and there. And, um, you know, and she said, why don't you become an illustrator? And so I went back to college. And if somebody would have told me when I went back to school at 24 that I would have, you know, been privileged to work on an, an image that became the most recognizable image in the world for about two months, um, I would have said, whose pipe dream is that? So <laughs> I'm a firm believer in setting, um, uh, you know, immediate goals. What are your immediate goals? What are your, your mid-range goals? What are your long-term goals? And, you know, it's kind of defining the mountain. If your mountain is here, and you're here, well, if you're just starting out in the arts, you're here, your mountain is here, your goal. I'm about here, you know? <laughs> so the choices I make, if I go one way or the other, the choices I make may not get me closer to my goal. So I start saying no to a lot of things, and I just said no to something yesterday because it doesn't get me closer to my goal. Well, if you're just starting out, even a a job that's over here is still getting you closer to your goal. So those are important things to know that as you start to refine your career, you start to realize, okay, this is the type of work I want to do. This is where I want my career to go. Um, and so it refines your choices. Early in your career as an artist, you are doing a variety of different things. You're trying a lot of things. And one of the things I used to tell students is sometimes the best job is the worst job because it motivates you to, or well, it tells you what you don't want to do. And then it motivates you to do something different. So, you know, those are all learning experience. Don't be so prideful to not ask for help. But then when you become successful, um, 
you know, reach back and in, in, uh, and help somebody else. I, I'm a firm, you know, I, I taught at a university for 20 some years while I worked in the industry and I still work in the industry and I still mentoring, you know, I found some folks up here in Idaho that found out what I do. And so I'm, I'm mentoring some, some young people. And one of them is a homeschooled um, young man and, and uh, super talented. So, um, you know, those are things that um, early in your career, ask for help um, and find a mentor, find somebody that is willing to show you, you know, um, you know, how to get from point A to point B without having to <laughs> do this. What, what are some examples of those first things that you felt were so far away from your goal? Oh, the, the, well, it wasn't away from my goal, but it was early in my career and it was horrific. I, I was drawing, okay, the, the, the technology when I was in college was the fax machine. Makes me sound like I'm ancient, but technology has really grown really fast. Um, and, and my apologies to the folks for starting a little bit late. That was my fault. Um, I wasn't getting into the right answer. <laughs> so, so that's for me to, and technology I'm usually, just flies these days. Yeah. Um, but the fax machine was big technology at the time. And so companies were transferring their catalogs, you know, they'd have these big giant catalogs, you know, really thick and they would have to mail them out to folks. Um, you know, so somebody might be interested in only one part of their catalog. So what they asked me to do is come in and sketch and do really refined ink drawings of their product so that they can just fax over pages in line work. Um, and so I did that 40 hours a week and oh, it was just, it was horrible. But again, <laughs> do, you, do you have like an example of like one particular thing that oh, you, you remember um, drawing and thinking, oh, wh what is this? <laughs> Well, just couches and lamps and furniture and all that stuff. And I like, love that. Okay, really, I'm running a family business. And then my first real job as an artist is just illustrating or drawing product for a catalog. Now, I drawing get lamps. With, yeah, I get to work on really cool stuff now. But again, that motivated me to do something different. Um, and it told me instantly, I don't want to just be a wrist. You know, I, I want to be an artist that or an illustrator that brings my my storytelling capabilities also. But looking at that job, it taught me value in the sense of lights and darks. It taught me perspective. It taught me all of these things because I was doing it 40 hours a week drawing furniture. Um, but it it told me pretty quickly that I didn't want to do that. Uh, for very long. So it motivated Some very me. practical lessons. Yes, absolutely. And I value that job and I value that work um, because it did hone certain skills. Um, but it I knew it wasn't going to be something that and that's kind of that perfect example of being just starting out and your ultimate goal is to do this. You know, those kinds of things are paying bills, um, you know, in that. So the only negative, the main negative is, is, yeah, I was drawing furniture. My wife gone, got to go on a vacation to Sweden and Norway and Denmark, and I had to stay home and draw early in my career. Sometimes draw we have to make some sacrifices. Yeah. <laughs> wow. So I, I'm, I'm, all, I'm holding in my hands one of my favorite pieces of art. Uh, this, this is the DVD set that you, you, you made back in, uh, when it was the complete saga, yeah. and this is this is an iconic cover here. It, it it really does make a huge impact on a person's perspective. I love uh, opening it up too, and you see these these images that are very stark and compelling. And you, you know, this this, this was when, when some when somebody first told me that Cliff Cramp was a homeschool dad. I was like, wait, this guy, <laughs> this guy. I was so excited. And you uh, and this one here, uh, the the I didn't the, do that one. Th this uh, one that, wasn't you. Yeah, that one wasn't mine. That was kind of ah. a, a uh, that is that's the image I was talking about, which was the most recognizable image in the world for you know thirty to sixty days, and we couldn't Very talk. Memorable. 
yeah, I, I, it was, I think we finished it in December and most of the credit for that particular image is, goes to my creative director, Cheryl Savala, who was probably one of the best um, creative directors I've ever worked with. And that's a really interesting story in and of itself. We went to college together and that's where, you know, you, you network, um, mm -hmm. uh, in all sorts of places, you know, so it's important, you know, the, the rap on homeschool is, is, oh, there's no, you know, social networking and all that. And I find that to be this silliest thing in the world. Um, but the, you know, you network and, you know, she brought me in on a project I had done about, oh, gosh, 50 to 75 covers for her. Um, at her studio from probably the late nineties through the early two thousands. And are these, um, are these DVD covers? Yeah. So I got to do, you know, all sorts of covers like the Marilyn Monroe box set and the, you know, and, and then that branched out to other studios hiring me to do, you know, so I got to do the Pink Panther box set. And I got to do almost all the Norman Lear TV show box sets, like all in the family and, you know, the Jeffersons and, you know, all of those shows. And, and so I've done um, a lot of, uh, you know, the Will Rogers stuff. And, you know, we had done some Gary Cooper and, and John Wayne. So I used to walk through the, the, uh, like Costco when they sold DVDs like crazy in the early 2000s. And I was just like, oh, that's one of my covers. Oh, that's one of the covers I worked on. <laughs> and so those were a lot of the covers that I worked on with, with Cheryl at her studio, Menagerie Creative, which really isn't, you know, it's just her now. She kind of folded in um, the, uh, the studio. But um, she was um, bidding on the job for Star Wars, and she had been one of the creative directors for most of the Star Wars DVDs and things like that. Yeah, and George, apparently they had they had submitted, there were three studios that sub got to submit three ideas a piece. And apparently George walked in and, and said, and this is the, how the, the story has been related to me, he walked in and he looked at him and he thought, yeah, this is it's Blu-ray and it's the complete saga on, uh, you know, on on Blu-ray. But he wasn't really happy with everything he saw. And he turned around, and he said, go back to the drawing board. I want a pink Vader. And what he meant by that and my creative director, Cheryl Savala, is brilliant. She got it. He didn't want something that was derivative of the time, Blu-ray, high def photo montage. Mm -hmm. She's sitting in the meeting going, um, George is one of the, he is probably the biggest collector of, an, of American illustration uh, in the world. Um, and he's opening a museum in LA uh, that is going to be absolutely gorgeous. She was like, illustration, it's not expected. Pink Vader. It's what's not expected. We're going to go illustration for the Blu-ray cover. So that's when she brought me in on the project. And, and it's mainly I was executing her ideas. So, um, and that's the great aspect. So a team of, project. Oh, absolutely. A lot of that stuff is collaboration. I'm working for a game studio up here right now, freelance um, in Idaho that had moved up here from, from California about five, six years ago. And, um, you know, it's all collaboration. So you really have to learn to collaborate. Now, a lot of the license stuff that I do, that's all me. I mm -hmm. get to invent and, and that. And so, and even some of the DVD covers, you know, I'll maybe go to the creative director and say, this is my take on it. Let me send you a few comps. Um, and sometimes they go fully with my take. And then other times they, uh, um, you know, they... You know, it's a collaborative, it's it's really a collaborative effort. So animation, film, um, illustration is is highly, highly collaborative. You know, it's not the the you know the the artist muse, you know, you you wait for it to strike and sit on your shoulder and tell you you're wonderful and you're gonna do a great painting and then you're ready to paint. No, I have deadlines. So the deadlines have to inspire me to do a good job. And so, you know, the, that whole notion of artist block, 
um, for the things that we do in animation and illustration and all that, you know, those things you have to work through. Um, you can't, you know, just say, well, I'm not inspired to work. That was one thing in college. If a student, you know, if they didn't have their thumbnails ready for me, um, you know, because I taught my courses in a professional manner. Um, if they didn't have the thumbnails ready, I was nice about it. Um, but I'd ask them, why don't you have your thumbnails? Well, I wasn't really inspired. And I would just have to go, um, my deadline should, should inspire you. <laughs> I was talking to a group of students uh, yesterday down in in Georgia, and we were talking about how, you know, sometimes it's difficult to to finish a project. Mm -hmm. And one of the students that uh, was talking about that, they said, yeah, I, I, I get really creative and my mind starts going all these different directions and everything. And then I get unable to move mm -hmm. to the to the goal. And I need I need to, to get to the goal. And we started talking about how deadlines actually help us make those key decisions. There, there's a lot of times where people and I think this is true in life, not just in art, where we, we feel like there's all these all these options out there. There's a wide world where a lot of things are, are possible. And mm -hmm. we, we let that be an excuse to not actually move. But right. deadlines, whether it's self-imposed or coming from somebody else that gets us to a point where a decision must be made and we must actually decide, am I going to college or am I, go, am I going to get this job done? Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, that there's a lot of things that, you know, within the arts that I kind of have to, you know, shove aside, like it's not just about me. Um, you know, as an illustrator, my audience is ultimately important because I'm communicating ideas to them. So I have to consider them. You know, it's not just about self-expression. Um, and there's artists that do that, but they're not illustrators um, because, you know, we're visual problem solvers. Um, and so we need to know history. We need to know, we need to investigate all sorts of things. Research is one of the funnest things I get to do. Um, you know, so those are all part of the job of being an illustrator is you have to be really well-rounded um, for me, to be able to draw lamps. Yes, exactly. Well, the th and that's the thing is, is you, you're, you have to know, um, you know, know your craft before you find your voice. <laughs> it's one of my philosophies is because the better, you know, your craft, the better visual communicator you are and the better, uh, and mo more effective communicator you become a comma can change the meaning of a sentence. You know, so can a line, a color, a value, a placement, all of those matter. And that's one of the things that, you know, I go through, you know, all my list. Why is this piece not working? If my wife comes into the studio and she's not she's not trained in an artist, she's lived with one, for, you know, an illustrator for all these years. But if she comes in and, you know, I say, well, what do you think? And she goes, oh, that's nice. And I'm like, what's wrong with it? She goes, well, I didn't say anything was wrong with it. And I'm like, well, she just said it was just nice. And I know I don't have the most successful piece because here's somebody that is looking at my work saying, yeah, it's, it's effective. It's nice. But it's, you know, but if she comes into my studio and goes, oh, wow, that's it's like, yeah, I did that. Your husband did that right there. Uh, you know, and I know I got it. And she's not trained but she understands the effective, you know, nature of visual communication um, just by appreciating, the, um, you know, the storytelling within the piece. So craft is really, really important. And the better you understand your craft, again, the better visual communicator you become. And that's, you know, I used to, one of my, I had sayings while I taught, one of my students did this giant poster of all my like they called them crampisms and they hung them in the room that I taught in, you know, and it was like light side, dark side, warm side, cool side, hard edge, soft edge, detail, suggestion, busy rest. And every single piece has to have those elements in there to kind of find a visual balance. Um, and then, you know, your placement of, you know, how well does it communicate? One of the simplest ways I can explain that is when I have a student or a young person that's asking me, well, what's the difference? You know, and I'm telling every decision I make um, matters to the story. So, um, 
you know, I would I would look at them and they would be sitting in my office and I'd say, do you feel comfortable in my office? And they would say, yeah. And I would immediately stand up and say, do you feel comfortable now? And they're sitting down and they'd look, they'd look up and they'd go, yeah. And I go, no, you don't. And they go, no, I don't. And I go, I'm the same subject. I just changed the vantage point of the camera, basically you, the vantage point, mm -hmm. and I changed the story. So every aspect of, you know, the choices I make, if I take the camera or I take the viewpoint in my illustration from a lower perspective or a higher perspective, those things matter. If you tilt your camera, right, it, things look a little bit odd. So if I took my computer and I was on the screen like that, like that, well, I kind of leaned with it. <laughs> that wasn't a very good example. <laughs> but um, it makes you feel slightly uncomfortable. It's called a Dutch angle. And, you know, in film, you know, the Dutch angle is you tilt it just to, to make the the um, architectural lines not look stable at right angles that now they're at an angle. And I start to feel a little less comfortable. Um, I used to bring students out into the hallway and I'd tell them, line up on either side of the hallway. And they would line up on either side of the hallway and I would just talk to them and I'd say, I'm talking to you, you know, kind of giving you a lecture in the hallway, waiting for somebody to come up the stairs into our hallway and have to start walking down the hallway with all these students <laughs> on either side. And the funniest thing was, is as soon as a student came up the stairs, turned left towards us and they would be looking down, they're walking right down the middle of the hallway. Mm -hmm. As soon as they look up and see us, they kind of picked a side. So like a center composition, if you feel comfortable in an environment, if you're approaching the a benevolent good king in an illustration, you're going to walk right down the middle of the aisle to the throne because you feel comfortable in this palace and in this environment. But if you don't, like Maleficent's castle, everything is at an angle. And there's a lot of sharp angles in that image. So shape tells a story. Angles tell a story. Your vantage point tells a story. Value, your lights and darks, your color, saturated, desaturated. They are all part of the storytelling process of visual communication. Well, and I, I think of uh, one, one of the, the works, uh, which uh, are um, Helping Hands. Is that, is, that, yeah. is that one of the ones you did? Uh -huh. Great. Uh, we're uh, we're going to put that in the comments uh, so people can see uh, a, a, a link to that. But uh, helping hands, I feel like that tells a story. There's there's a there's a there's a moment that's being captured right there when you know the, the, there's two droids and the suns are setting and the and the mist is rising and there's there's just there's, there's so much motion in that moment mm -hmm. uh, when when you when you're looking to tell one of your stories, what are some of the elements that you're looking for to kind of capture the audience's attention, to capture yeah. their, their mind? So in something like that, it, the kind of the backstory on that type of work is I get, I am now a licensed Lucasfilm illustrator. My contract is in limbo right now, but under that I got, I get to do anything in the Star Wars universe. So that's me. That's where I get my wrist comes in and my brain comes in. So that's that's purely me doing images for the Star Wars um, fans and the, the collector's market. Um, so I kind of talk or it's it's a little bit like um, cutting room floor stuff. So I think about the cutting room floor stuff that or that I, the stories I'd like to tell in the Star Wars universe that aren't in the movies, but they don't, you know, they, they're, you know, they don't go against the canon of star Wars. Right. Yeah. They're not on so, camera, but there's something that yeah. would have happened. Yes. It, it, you know, so, you know, you're looking at Tatooine, um, a, a pivotal, you know, location in the, in the star Wars saga. And really it's about the relationship, you know? Um, and it, it kind of it came from, you know, I look at everything and everything kind of strikes me as like, ooh, ooh, what about, you know, um, and that was kind of the, the inspiration really came from 
um, observing an old man helping a child. Hmm. And, and so here I'm tasked to do, um, you know, Star Wars work, but an old man helping a child um, sticks in my brain. So, um, you know, it's that relationship thing. These are two droids um, that, you know, droids don't really have a lot of, of emotive qualities. Um, so the emotive qualities aren't going to be in gesture. I mean, they, they're, you know, R2-D2 and C-3PO, you know, they may make sounds, so they do sounds and voice inflection. Um, but I thought, well, in this one, I don't get to do sounds in illustration or voice inflection in illustration. So it's going to have to be told through gesture. So the physical gesture of that and, you know, those those visual library things of the old man bending down to help a child um, was the visual kind of cue that that said, how do I put the significance of their relationship together? And then I just love sunsets. So I just figured tattooing two suns got to be in the sunset, a real warm you know, um, peace. So, you know, the, the warmth of the piece kind of goes with the, the, um, you know, the, the gesture and the connection, um, to these characters. It's like, amazing I, how often there's a story behind the story. Yeah. And there's just the, 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 the older <clears throat> man reaching down to help a child and, in a in a war and the warmth that that communicates was able to inspire yeah. i what i one of the pieces that i think is is a very beautiful beautiful piece Thank of yours you. uh you, you so you know star wars is phenomenal and you've got so much of a portfolio there that's that's um it's so expansive but mm -hmm. uh, another fandom that uh I, I think a lot of our audience would be interested in is some of the stuff you've done in lord of the rings so we're gonna we're gonna put another picture in the comments it's uh the shire mm -hmm. and it's a very different uh moment uh, yeah you're, you're capturing something very different in a totally different uh world a different fandom uh what what first off i guess what uh, pulls you into the Lord of the Rings world, and second, what uh, what what are you looking for when you're building something like a like a Shire? Yeah, you know that being able to work on Star Wars is like a pipe dream. It's just, and then my other favorite, you know, is um, the Tolkien books, and then the Peter Jackson movies. Um, you know, and to be able to work on those, I do those for a. Uh, a licensor called Bottleneck Gallery, and they're based in New York. So they saw, yeah, I had some connections with them prior to, and they're, they're just a great licensor to work with. Um, I had some connections with them prior to doing Star Wars, but the Star Wars folks kind of, um, that licensor, you know, um, contacted me first. Um, and then the Lord of the Rings folks contacted me to start doing um, kind of the fan base stuff that I get to do with Star Wars with Lord of the Rings. So I get to work on basically two of my favorite properties. And and most of that is what a blessing. Oh uh, I can't I can't tell you how how just wonderful that job is. I'm working on Lord of the Rings. I do have a Hobbit release coming soon. My last Lord of the Rings release sold out in 20 minutes. So there were, wow. there were 14 pieces and all 14 sold out in 20 minutes when they, uh, when they released them. So, um, and I, I do get APs, so artist proofs, and that's what I bring to like Comic-Con because I have a booth uh, at Comic-Con. But, you know, a lot of the, the, the kind of the, once you start doing licensing work for one group, then, you know, and then I have, I, I did the Swamp Thing TV show poster um, based on the, my work for Lord of the Rings through Warner Brothers. So it, it's, they're owned by Warner Brothers. So all my connected. work you go through approval to Warner Brothers. Hmm. Like my work for Star Wars, if I do original paintings, if I do digital paintings, they just go to, um, Lucas, um, for Lucas Films for approval. But if I do originals, all those go to, to, um, Mr. Lucas for first rights. So he's purchased a few of my original pieces. So that's that's a pleasure. But as far as the 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 Lord of the Rings stuff, um, I get to 
they really have brought me in as an environment specialist because that's what I did in as a background painter in animation was environment. So I love painting outdoors. I love painting environments. Um, and so that's one of the things that like even the, the game company, I've gotten to do some some character designs. Um, I can't tell you what the game is about. It's not released yet, but, um, but, you know, to be able to do environments and things like that, but that's how I got brought in to do, um, the, uh, the environments for, um, Lord of the Rings. So the Shire piece is just, I mean, for me, the, the, the epic location of just serenity is the Shire. You know, and the Shire through the wars, you know, is never really affected. Um, it could be if it doesn't go the right way. Mm -hmm. um, but it is that place of serenity. So, and I just love that. And those were, um, I wanted to do yard longs. Um, they were an old Victorian style of illustration. Because in the Victorian, they, you know, the, everything, every little nook and cranny was covered. You know, all the walls were covered with stuff and tchotchkes everywhere. And, you know, it was clutter. Um, but, I mean, controlled clutter. Um, mm -hmm. But they did these yard longs because they were a unique um, size of painting because they would hang them in between windows. So you had a space between a window. What do you put there? Well, they put these yard long and they were usually advertisements. So they had uh -huh. For you know um, all sorts of things, and I used to collect those. I put myself through college picking antiques, so I love that you see my office. I have craftsman furniture throughout, and I, I live in a 1910 craftsman style home. Um, but uh, sorry for the digression there. Um, <laughs> you know, so I decided I was going to do these yard longs, but in a horizontal way. Um, and they turned out great and uh um i mean great that sounds egotistical i mean it, they turned out the the idea turned out great um and the fans um really you know gobbled them up and i see tons of yard longs now um so many different illustrators are going back and doing this yard long format these either long horizontals or long vertical uh, images and I got to do some of the yard longs for Marvel, so I did the Captain America and, and uh, um, Spider Man, and uh, they released those as as yard longs. So the nice thing now is is you know you get to a point in your career where you know you want to work on um, fun projects with really good folks, and that's kind of where I am in my career. It, I don't have to work on um, you know, IPs, intellectual properties that are, are, you know, worldwide and that just as long as I'm working on really fun stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I'm, the game studio that I'm working with right now is a small studio, but the folks are fantastic. Um, that makes a big difference. I, yeah. I almost wish I was in house because then I'd get to, they get to bring their dogs to work. And it's, oh. it's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, I, I was thinking about the Shire in particular, because one of the things, uh, so if anybody wants to follow you, I, I, I would recommend their Instagram or your Instagram. Uh, well, Instagram Clifford. is where I post a lot of my like sketches and roughs and, and a lot of stuff that doesn't get to see the light of day, you know, so that doesn't go to print and all of that. So. And that's that's Cliff Cramp illustration on Instagram. And one of the things that you post there a lot, which I, I you know, I'm in my mind, there's a connection between the Shire because, you know, the, the Shire to me symbolizes what you said. There's that that beautiful place that hasn't been touched by evil yet. But there's there's you know, there's risk and, you know, there's there's all this, you know, this it's worth protecting that that's what the Shire is in, yes. in my mind. And then you've, you've posted over the years, you've posted several times. I think it's different renditions of the same thing. And it's, it's the sea and rocks. Oh yeah. And, and I'm, you know, in my mind, you know, I'm, I'm just making up this story. So you're going to have to set me straight. But in my mind that that's the sea and the rocks, which you you've, you've done so many different versions of, and you just, you, you, you keep coming back to that. It makes me think that it may be in some way, this is your Shire. This, this is, this is something that you uh, feel is precious in some way and, and worth uh, holding tight. It was, 
Um, I have a new, I mean, because that's where in between projects, I'd go to the beach and paint. Ah. So a lot of those are on location paintings. Um, and then I have so many beach paintings in my, you know, mental library now that I don't have to be at the beach to, to mm -hmm. paint the beach anymore. And it's a really good way for me, even, you know, being here in Idaho, um, to teach young people how to paint when I'm showing them doing quick paints. I'll generally start with a beach because it's a great place to find edge in form. So with the rocks and I love painting rocks and water and churning, but that was, yeah, that was my, the beach has always been, and the ocean has always been my quiet place. Um, but because we've moved out of California to Idaho, if you notice lately, most of my paintings are like the Creek that run through my neighborhood. I live in the Hills above Boise. So it's just a few minutes for us to get to Boise, but we're like out in the country in this really cool community called Hidden Springs. And it's beautiful. And, um, and two minutes out of my house, I could be up in the Hills, you know, with the creeks and the, you know, we have elk that come through the community, herds of elk and deer, deer a block and a half away from me um, breed and they have their babies, you know, the little does in the, or the fawn in the, in the wetlands that's right by my house. So I've got, got a new Shire. I have a new Shire and it is, it's wonderful. And it's just, it is that place where you go and the clouds here are just like amazing. And I love to paint clouds and in California. Yeah. We'd get clouds, but usually after the rain, but how often did it rain in California? This year it's rained a ton in California. I understand that. So you're having awesome clouds, but you know, in California, it was, you know, pretty much blue sky um, with a little smattering of a little strip of clouds and that. Um, whereas, you know, I'm, I get to actually look at clouds almost all the time. So it's kind of that big sky country. Um, yeah. So, I mean, and that's what I would recommend. I have my assignment work that I do and I love it. Um, but I have my personal work. And the nice thing is I just had some people from a design studio, um, come to my house and they took eight of my paintings and a lot of them, my beach paintings, um, because there are a lot of California transplants where we are. Um, but they want to start selling some of my landscapes that I do for me. Um, and so that's kind of, you know, a new, you know, a new thing to, you know, to do. So I'd like to do a lot more Idaho centric art um, and maybe get involved in some of the kind of the local um, art local scene. Player like that yeah um but you know i'm still gonna you know do star wars <laughs> of course and marvel of course i i, I my my mother was the artist in in my life who really inspired me to consider these these things like design and mm -hmm. and you know the the beauty of the world around us. Uh, she, yeah. she she was a bit of she still she still paints and and uh, yeah. sends awesome. me sends me little watercolors or whatever she she's inspired to do at the moment. But she always would say that uh, for her uh, living near the sea, uh, she grew up in Puerto Rico, or living near the mountains. She lives in Colorado now. Uh, mm -hmm. She needs those. She needs something like that that just uh, reminds her of the vastness of creation yeah. and the beauty yeah. of the world in a in a grand scale, and yeah. uh, that that always inspires her. And and you know, there's so much beauty around us, and I think sometimes the arts, you know, focuses on the negative, you know. And I'd always tell my students, you know, there's nothing wrong with you create, you know, because they, they, you know, they'd be you know, not to get into the stuff of the university, but, you know, they would be encouraged to, to just be rah, and pound on, you know, real negative themes. And I'd say, you're more than welcome to tell positive stories in my class, hmm. you know. And so my goal was just to basically teach the young people to be the best visual com communicators they can be. So one, one of your, your stories that I personally love is St. George and the Dragon. Yep. <laughs> I, have, uh, I have a huge collection of St. George stuff uh, from awesome. all over the world whenever I travel. And I just, I love the, this. And it's, to me, it's a very positive story of overcoming 
evil. And yes. you know, Saint George, of course, was you know the historic figure was a was a Roman soldier who who uh, was martyred. Uh, martyred mm -hmm. for his faith. And and I think the legend grows up because sometimes we have to face big things in yeah. life. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I we'll put, we'll put the, uh, the, the link to St. George and the dragon. Uh, but this is one of my, my favorite pieces here. And it, it, I actually have a cliff cramp. Uh, print, <laughs> uh, so I'm, I'm pretty happy with this, but uh, uh, could you talk, tell us a little bit about this story and, and why you, you picked it up as, as a story to tell? Is it well, I mean, a cool dragon. Yeah, you know, I've always loved. I love to paint just about anything and everything. <laughs> um, and so you look at your portfolio and you go, you know what? I want to do work for this company, and they're a fantasy company, and I don't have a lot of dragons. So sometimes it's a matter of just filling holes in your portfolio, and I think that was one of those. And I'm like, okay, well, what? Who's what St. George and the Dragon? I'm going to do St. George and the Dragon. Um, so it was good that, enough for Raphael, good enough for Cliff Cramp. Yeah, yeah. And so, well, one of the things was uh, um, I, that was a demo in class. Oh, wow. So, oh, and I, the funny story of this demo was um, they somebody says, paint a dragon because you don't have, and I'm like, yeah, I don't have very many dragons. I don't have any dragons in my portfolio. And I'm thinking, I want to do fantasy work. I don't have any dragons. So, you know, because I'd walk into class sometimes and just say, what do you want to see painted today? So a lot of stuff on my website was just from those, like, somebody says, want to see a guy riding a bear? So it's like, all right, guy riding a bear. I'm going to make him a steampunk, you know, dystopian event, guy riding a bear with a, you know, a mechanical arm and so i think that's on my website that was on my website and it was a disastrous uh demo the the uh or it's on my website but it was um when they asked me do a dragon and i'm thinking okay and i'd already you know been processing want to send stuff to wizards of the coast want to send stuff to these other companies i need more you know high fantasy dragon wizard stuff and that in my portfolio and this request came up i started the demo it was one of those my students i'd always tell them in class okay there's no three things while i'm doing a demo demo's going fine if i'm talking my way through it you know and i'm i'm we're just going through it most of those if you don't hear me talk a whole lot i'm in the zone and don't interrupt me just watch me <laughs> didn't happen a ton, but, and then if you hear me say, you get the idea, you know that I'm not pleased with this demo. I think I said, you get the idea about 40 times during that video. I was just going, oh, this is just not going well. And I go, yeah, I'm going to do, we're going to do St. George and the Dragon. And I'm, you know, cause I love that story. And so I'm drawing and I'm putting it together and it's not coming out well. And, and, uh, so, yeah, there's times where, you know, I wasn't a, a faculty member that um, wasn't embarrassed to produce garbage in front of my class. It was, you know, the students were like, Cliff, it wasn't that bad. So the next week I made just some little drawovers and I brought it back the next week and I said, OK, I've corrected the perspective on the dragon. <laughs> We're going to finish this dragon because this was one of the most embarrassing demos I've ever done. And it turned out now to be one of my favorite pieces. So so it's that's a lesson of you correct things. If you've got a good idea and it's you're not executing it properly, just go back and correct it, you know. And there are times where, you know, I wasn't getting it squared away and you need a little break from it. And a week later, I came back and and finished up the demo and it turned out, you know, <laughs> in Jeremiah's possession. <laughs> <laughs> what a world. What a world. Ah, well, I'm loving all these stories. We, uh, I, wa I want to uh, let the audience know if they have any particular questions, uh, uh, let us know. Let me scroll through to see uh, if, if I've missed any. But so Here's uh, another dragon one I just finished. So I'm bringing this oh, one. Uh, that's epic. So, so I'm Iconic. doing it. I'm, yeah, I'm doing a bunch of dragons lately. So, and then I did a portrait series that are that I finished twelve um, of the of the original 
trilogy portraits so you can see just some of the originals so your studio must be uh, amazing amazing it's, well it's i have my my traditional studio is in the garage um because i can't paint and oil inside the house um and then my mother we have a full house my boys are still living with us and my mother-in-law who's 88 lives with us um and so as we become a little bit more empty nesters, my studio in the house, I think I'll move some of it into the house. So I have a digital studio, which I'm in now. So that's where I do a lot of my digital comps. Um, and then I have a, we have a two deep car garage. So the back part of the garage is my traditional studio. Wow. Well, Miranda, uh, she's, she's watching us online live and she says her son is, is, um, in high school and he wants mm -hmm. to be an animator and okay. uh loves star wars uh mm -hmm. but uh she was wondering how uh, what advice would you give to somebody who's in high school and they want to step into the arts as a career um the first thing that you should be doing is drawing every day um it should be instead of journaling you're journaling by drawing so for every birthday and every Christmas, um, if they're a little bit farther apart, um, get them a new sketchbook and they should fill that sketchbook up to the time to get them a new sketchbook. And it should be an incentive. They should be drawing all the time and mostly from observation at this point in time. So um, they should just be drawing what they see. Um, one of the things I would recommend is anime is gigantically popular. Draw anime, but don't focus on anime. And the reason being is um, nobody hires or very few animation studios hire for anime style of drawing. Worry about doing, not style. So draw, do just draw. Style emerges by doing. Um, when I was in school, everybody was, you know, it was like, you got a style, you got a style, you got a style. And I'm looking around going, I don't have any style. I just paint, you know. And about 10 years out of college, somebody said, hey, Cliff, did you do? And I go, yeah. You know, they saw a magazine cover or something. And they said, did you do that? And I go, yeah, how'd you know? And they go, I could tell your style anywhere. I was like, I got <laughs> Finally, I got style. Style emerges <laughs> by doing and the important thing is that you do um, and that you draw. You draw anything and everything. I mean, you see toys that are in my office, um, Iron Giant and things like that. Just set these up, look at them, sketch them, draw them. Um, give your, 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 uh, your, any aspiring young person that wants to do this should draw from observation and then start drawing from imagination but first observe look at a tree you know start breaking things down into their basic um shapes um the human body is a peanut okay and that's the the upper torso and the lower to lower torso so if you break things down into general shapes then you could become much more compl or develop much more complicated shapes. So you go from general to specific. The head is an oval. Um, one of the exercises I used to give, even when I talk, and I'm, I'm gonna be talking to a, a woman in technology group on about Star Wars um, in uh, next month, I might hand out cards and say, draw an oval, draw a line where the eyes are. Well, the mm -hmm. eyes are right in the middle of the head. Um, and a lot of people put them too high because um, they're not thinking about this part right here, okay? Mm -hmm. So the eyes are in the middle of the head. You have five eyes in your head. Did you know that? Well, no. you've got one, you've got two, you've got three, you've got four and five. So these spaces are generally equally divided into five huh. spaces. Your nose is halfway, and it, and these are these are you know ideals, I guess. I have a bigger nose and bigger ears, um, but your nose is generally halfway between your eyes and your chin, and then your mouth is one third down. Your ears usually go from your brow to the lower part of your nose, unless they're a little bigger. Your mouth usually dissects your eyes, 
So you start really observing things in order to be able to make them up. So you you look at, you know, the the arm could be a cylinder, you know, draw a, co draw a Coke can. So if this was a Coke can, and I'm not going to do it because I have my uh, flavored water in here, but you start drawing a Coke can at different angles uh -huh. so that you get the ellipses and understand foreshortening and things like that. So they should be drawing. And the thing is, you can make a very good living in animation. You can make a very good living in games. I mean, the a journeyman salary starts, I think, now in the high 80s or the low 90s. Uh, and then you're making six figures within a short period of time. But remember, it's a craft-driven industry. You have to be good at what you do. So you've got to put in the miles. Um, the club at our school was called the Pencil Mileage Club because you had to put miles on your pencil in order to get good. And so if somebody Imagine is... Imagine that. It's hard yeah, work. It is it is hard work. And it's... How, you know, go ahead. I, I was going to ask, how do you motivate... How uh, Kara actually asked this. She says, "How do we? How do I motivate myself to draw when I don't have an external pressure to to push me?" It's just like anything else. I've gained twenty five pounds during this winter, which we've had a nice winter here, and I've got to lose that weight. So if I'm going to actually be successful at a goal, I've got to put in the time and effort, and it just becomes part of a daily routine. So. Make a routine. Um, it's it's a daily routine um, and you draw even when you don't feel like drawing because, um, you know, and that's early in your career. Like my yeah, I could take a day or two off. But if 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 I go two weeks without picking this up, something's wrong. OK, because this is what I do. You know, it, I don't do this only when I feel like it. I do this in order to put, you know, food on the table. Um, so, you know, you do that to, you know, it's a, it is a job. I feel, and it, it this job that I get to do doesn't make me better than anybody else. <laughs> um, you know, when I, you know, need the pipes fixed in my house, I don't want, you know, I want somebody who's really good and responsible and has been doing it and has a good reputation. Um, you know, my my philosophy is be nice, be on time and do good work. Now, I wasn't on time today because of technology, but those are really important things is be nice, be on time, do good work. But as far as, um, you know, the the um, um you know, fitting it into your schedule, it is something that just like, look, um, was that Kara, my old student, that asked that question? That's a good question. I don't know. Who I dearly, uh, who I dearly enjoyed. Um, <laughs> I think so. Um, the, you know, you are now a mother, you have responsibilities, you are a wife. Um, but it's one of those things where you fit a little bit of time. I really mm -hmm. have to take an assessment. And those are all, I mean, those are all important things, Kara. Your, your, you know, your baby is just beautiful. Um, you know, your relationship, I got to see that before you got married. And, um, you know, and those are things that, you know, you have to prioritize where, you know, and, and the first things that drop off of my priority is, you know, spending time on this, you know, how much time do uh. we waste? This. Cut down on the devices. Exactly. You start to say, okay, these are the important things. Um, you know, there are most important things. You guys, if I couldn't do this tomorrow, my my life wouldn't be over. Um, you know, if I if I couldn't draw or paint tomorrow um, for the rest of my life, I would find something else to fill that um, fill that void of of what life I is do. beautiful. Exactly. Absolutely. Um, uh, I, I, hopefully I get to ride this for as long as possible. But it really is um, just encapsulated is just to prioritize um, mm -hmm. and and use it as a journal. So Jenna, uh, she says her, her son loves to draw architecture and vehicles. 
Mm. Uh, but her daughter loves to draw people. And she's wondering if there's uh, any resources for like poses. How do you find po like where do you get that inspiration for a daughter who who wants to to kind of diversify okay. the the compositions that she's tackling? I just said get off of this a little bit. But <laughs> get off I the phone. Do, but <laughs> and I use this, you guys. Um, there's a there's a uh, art pose. It's called art pose. I think it's, it's like 15 bucks and you can actually. Um, so is it an up. app? It's an app um, okay. that you can pull up uh, and uh, I use it when I need to. I think one of my Spider-Man pieces, it's like, that's just not looking right. I have to check it out. So uh, I don't know if you can see it. Eh, it's not really showing up there. Barely. Oh, a little bit. Yeah. So it's art pose, but you have, this is a standard T pose, but you have all sorts of different poses that are programmed in, but then you can move the body into a specific pose that, um, that I'd recommend. Also these Bandai figures, I use these all the time. I got a whole bunch of them. Um, you know, you can have and make somebody kick and do all of that kind of stuff. Um, and they are exceptional. I would, I would highly recommend um, these Bandai figures to, um, um, you know, just keep on your desk and draw. Uh, as far as architecture, um, you know, there are there are architects and vehicle gamers and modelers that's that are very specific in in doing. Um, that's what they do. They they build and create the vehicles. They build and create the environments as as far as um, you know, uh, city dwellings and things like that. Um, you know, I would, there's a lot of resources out there online now, um, that I would highly recommend, you know, if you're, if you're, you don't need a college degree to do what I do. Okay. You need a good portfolio. Nobody has ever asked me for my portfolio. I have a, I have a terminal degree in illustration. The only thing that I've ever used that terminal degree for was to get the job at the university. So <laughs> sometimes education serves education. And, and to be honest with you, some of the greatest artists that I know are rejected by universities to teach there. And they are phenomenal teachers and visual communicators. But because they don't have the terminal degree to teach, they're not allowed to teach at a university. So you find people that can mentor you. And there's a lot of schools. There's, um, there's concept design Academy, there's brainstorm, there's different places like that. If you're, if you're, um, a child wants to go into, um, the gaming industry or animation, and if they have specific goals and the beauty of that is they can teach you very specific classes. Um, I was fortunate to work, uh, under a very supportive administration at the time. Um, and they allowed us to create very specific classes in a really good program at a state university. Um, but administrations change. And then, you know, I wasn't teaching under, a, and that's one of the reasons why I left. I wasn't teaching under a supportive administration. And, um, you know, canceling classes and programs and not hiring um, who we wanted to hire part time to teach courses and things like that um, became a big frustration. So if you're going to go the college route, know the ultimate goal of the industry. Um, and then you have to be really, really discerning, um, you know, uh, I know of a community college in sounds in, like you have to learn how to say no to some things. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's, it's a lot of colleges aren't going to teach you the things you need to know. I gave a lecture one time and I was it, kind of like a talk like this that we're doing and just basic understanding of composition design, you know, story, all of those things. And a young person came up to me and said, um, Cliff, I learned more in this hour talk, and I don't mean this this way at all. I don't, I don't mean that. It was actually quite shocking, and it kind of was heartrending. Um, and she said, you know, I, I went to school, art school for four years, and I learned more in this hour talk than I did in all of art school. 
And so there are programs like that. So if they are going for a degree in the arts, you need to be very discerning um, of the college and what they offer, because ultimately, you know, they want to be able to do this for a living, not not necessarily, you know, and and so, you know, that, those are things that um, are important to find subsequent. I taught at a private university early in my career because I enjoyed just teaching when I was just I just taught a class here and there. Right, and I can private. tell you're a bit of a teacher. You're, you're just telling us tell us the <laughs> stories you're teaching us here. But one of the things that I, I told them, it was a it was a fine university, but their art program wasn't great. But I was in that art program just teaching one class. And I told the young man, you need to supplement your education. If you this is a great school, um, you're meeting great friends and and but know that you need to supplement your education. And he did. And he's very successful now. Um, and so, um, you know, that's the thing is, is you you do need to I still take classes from from friends and um, things like that at some of these, um, you know, there's brainstorm and um, design, uh, design studio cat or design. Uh, it's in Pasadena. I can't remember the name right now. There's <laughs> CMA, um, there's schoolism, I think is still around. Some of them have gotten really pricey, um, but you know, or you find, I, I, you know, well, it sounds uh, like you, you've made it a, a lifelong project to continue to grow and to learn. Oh, it's you never stop learning and you never stop growing. I, I am amazed at how talented some of these young people are. And I'm an old gopher. And it's like, well, I'm not, I'm, I still have a lot of miles left on me, um, but I'm f much farther down the tracks and I better learn the stuff that's current to my industry mm -hmm. um like digital technologies and working with different platforms and things like that um you know as well as doing the the traditional work so i'm always finding new places new venues things like that it's it's you know you the people that you know it's it's typical of the animation industry you had a lot of great animators that drew exceedingly well but they didn't want to learn the digital technology that that the industry was now moving into and they don't work anymore. You know, a lot of them go have gone on and taught, but they're teaching old technology and old platforms that are still, you know, the fundamentals are still very important, but their careers as, as creators um, basically disappeared because they didn't keep up with what's going on in with in the industry so as we as we kind of move to the the close i, I guess my my last question mm -hmm. for you is is how, you're you're dealing with like this life of of learning you've got your own story you've learned to tell stories there's a lot of things that have come together here and what what keeps what is it about art that you love the most and keeps you coming back to the canvas and saying, I'm going to, I'm going to create yet again. Um, you know, I think it's a lot of it is, you know, of any creative, if you are, if you are taking your audience seriously and appreciate them, not, not in a, you know, like, Oh, look who I am, you know, or, 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 you know, that kind of stuff. Um, you know, I, I immediately go the other way. Sometimes I'm at a party and somebody says, hey, Cliff, you know, there's there's a guy over there who's a is an artist, too. You ought to go meet him. And it's just like, I'll get over there eventually. But, you know, Joe right here, who's a, you know, who's a carpenter. I He's really interesting and exciting and, you know, that, that kind of thing. So, um, you know, sometimes the arts can be really insular. I love really. And that's one of the reasons why I do conventions is because interacting with um the audience um i think one of my big ones to really start interacting with the audience was when i did a um, lucasfilms had me do an after dark um uh event at disneyland for star wars and you know somebody had collected my work and they were just i mean 
they came up and they were like, you know, wow, I just really love your work. And so it's it's that kind of response when you get somebody that that says and if you do this, you're also going to have critics. So oh, yeah. you're gonna get you're gonna get ooh, 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 you know those ow, that one hurt a little bit. Um, you know, so you're gonna get that too, but it's really when you when you do something and you find that the the audience really appreciates what you do, there is a lot of a lot of satisfaction in that. And it's and it's it's trying to, you know, it's really kind of being humble and in all of the experiences, one at one uh, Comic Con, a young man came to me, and he had, you know, he was with his mom, and he had just graduated high school, and his mom had brought him there to buy a piece of art from his favorite artist, and <clears throat> he stopped by where I was. I was doing a signing and doing some live paint, and and we were talking, and you know, kind of just like we're talking today about, hey, what do you do? I really want to go into the arts, and what do you do? And we we just had this really nice conversation for about a half an hour, and then he he left, and then he came back. And we had another conversation, and he left, and he came back, yeah. and then finally his mom said, uh, he goes, I I want to buy one of your pieces for my hmm. graduation, and I was like, oh wow, you know, and then his, you know, he. He got a piece that George Lucas owns the original to, and they're all sold out now. And so it's a really significant piece of mine. And and he kind of walked away and his mom came back and she said, you know, Cliff, I just I want to just say that, you know, he really wanted to buy this piece of art from this other artist. That's his favorite artist. But the other artist was not nice. And he was a real big stinker and he treated everybody horribly. And my son was just like, and how humbling is that to just, you know, you know that you're in a field that you're working and people appreciate your work. And, you know, and if they're supporting you, you, you need to be kind to those individuals. So a lot of motivation is just to keep doing fun images for the audience that's collected the work. Well, and, and there's there's something to be said for just having character. You know, the you you are uh, what I what I love about this this discussion is is you're you're real. You're you're talking to the audience. You're you're willing to uh, answer their their questions, to engage, and tell a little bit of your story. And we're enjoying your art all along the way. And that full package is what makes Cliff Cramp in my my world cliff cramp and i'm i'm privileged to call you a friend and i'm so thankful that you've been able to join us here today well appreciate it thank you for your time we will uh post uh some of cliff's uh work uh in the comments you can go to his website as well uh parents hslda wants to give your homeschool child a chance to shine and pursue their creative skills as we talked about earlier uh look for opportunities and HSLDA holds yearly contests. This is an opportunity uh, in the arts, and uh, we'll put a link in the contest or in the comments for the contest to give you more detail where you can find information how your your, your students can enter their their little masterpieces uh, for for uh, HSLDA staff to enjoy because they go in the hallway here, and I get to to walk down and just enjoy these creative, creative works. Uh, also make sure you sign up for our email list so you can get notified uh, for our 2023 contest dates. If you're not a member of HSLDA, we'd love to have you join us. You can go to our website, hslda.org slash join. Thanks again, Cliff, for joining us. And we hope uh, you. you all have a great day.